Welcome. Today we are going to do the small teardown of the parts of the electronic parts of the Tronxy X5 SA500 Pro uh, as I promised in the unboxing video. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would like to open up is the power supply simply because I'm interested in whether the uh, terminals are crimped or whether they are soldered or just straight plugged in without anything. The good thing is the very early versions of um, Chinese manufactured printers did not even have an acrylic shield or the um, fuse holder with the ICE plug holder and the on off switch. So that is a good thing. Um, but I see that more and more 3D printers from China do include these things now. Um, honestly, um, without them they are very unsafe, especially if you're new to electronics in general. Uh, you could easily uh, electrocute yourself or burn down your, down your house. So let's get straight into it. Yes, this is these ones Come on. Let me get a flathead. Try to pry them out. look like it wants to cooperate with me here. Come on. Okay, I suppose we have to disassemble the acrylic enclosure, otherwise we won't get to the interesting bits. The unfortunate thing, you really need to disassemble it anyway, because this brown uh, paper sheet on top of it, on top of the acrylic parts, you won't get it off completely without removing all the screws because um, they did not partially remove it so you will always get those small brown bits stuck around these parts. This, now it lifts, lifts off. Okay, okay, that explains why I 
couldn't easily unscrew it. They have nuts on the other side. But I have to say, this all looks pretty, pretty darn good. I wouldn't say there's any problem with that. Everything seems to be crimped appropriately. Yeah, that's that's great. Good thing to see that. Everything is shielded from the user. Yes, great. I really like what I'm seeing here. The only thing I would like to be changed a little bit is an additional wire from the neutral, for, from the shield here, to the uh, aluminium bed construct, construction or the construction in its entirety, just to get extra protection. But I mean, it is powered with the, um, with the, um, with the two wires here, and they are not, um, alternating current, but direct current, so it shouldn't be a problem, but it would be very nice, a lot better to have an additional wire here just to ground the aluminum um, frame of the 3D printer. But otherwise, it's totally okay. Nothing soldered in here. The wire shoes here seem to be tight and isolated. Yeah. Completely okay. Not the best design, but I would say it's good enough to not burn down your house, hopefully. Which is always the great thing. Not burning down your house is probably quite a good thing. Off camera, I will disassemble this one again to uh, remove all these um, covers, the uh, brown covers, to make it look a little bit, little bit more clean. But I uh, will save you the trouble to uh, watch me doing this. And the last screw was here. That was our hex type. So perfectly reassembled. And again, this is a 24 volt, 21 amp power supply. Um, the 500 series does not come in a version which uh, has a 21 volt. A 12 volt supply so that's not a problem but I know, but I know that the 400 series and the standard X5 SA series do happen to come with 12 volt power supplies which uh, are not that great um, yeah simply because uh, heating up the bed with a 12 volt power supply is really really taking quite a long time as far as I have heard and read on the internet. So this is the heat 
just uh, assembly the heat plug and everything already assembled which makes this a little bit easier to install the whole thing um, from the outside this is the inductive sensor for the auto mesh bed leveling um, I have heard, heard different things from these particular ones um, some say they work great others say well they are pretty darn crappy um, and well we'll see how well they will perform but I'm interested in looking into the um, the business part you could say um, to see which diameter the heat break has because uh, for me it's interesting to upgrade this to a, a completely um, metal one so an all metal hot end um, to be able to easily print things like uh, ABS and perhaps a little bit of nylon if it's going to stick to the heat bed and uh, you pretty much need to have an all metal hot end for that to work or otherwise your PTFE tube will degrade and you will breathe toxic gases and well that's not really something interesting you want to do in your free time especially if you're uh, like your brain the way it is currently um, because those fumes are quite toxic so I guess let's remove these crimps first let me get something because the tube is a little bit in the way Perfect. I guess let's start with removing the sensor here. This is also something important. The sensor um, has these long holes here. If you need to adjust the sensor to get an accurate uh, leveling of your bed, otherwise there is a good chance the nozzle will drive itself into the bed, which definitely will leave a mark on it. So that's something to keep in mind when we assemble the printer to uh, pretty much push it down all the way and see if and go from there um, because I want to be on the safe side and not accidentally um, destroy the bed because the size of the bed makes replacing it quite expensive This looks promising. Perfect. Okay, now we have access to all the important parts. The first thing, the cooler fan for the filament does not seem to be perfectly engineered, at least the air duct here. It kind of blows downwards more than to the side and well we'll see how that performs but uh, I have my doubts about that especially PLA will need a lot of cooling but it looks like it's quite easy to modify so even if it doesn't perform perfect I'm confident in being able to replace it easily. The cool thing or the nice thing they now come with uh, the silicone socks pre-assembled and pre-installed which is a nice touch. It makes heating up the the heat block a lot faster. 
and also a lot more stable. So this is the MK8 or MK10. I believe it's an MK8 style because the MK10, I believe, also has some uh, stabilizing screws here on the side to make it more difficult to break the heat break. Um, let's see whether I can remove it without having, I believe I have to cut it. Well, that's a strain relief anyway. But there does not seem to be any thermal crease here. Normally you would uh, put some thermal crease here to get a faster transfer of the heat from the heat break to the uh, cooler here. Um, they seem to be missing this. A little bit unfortunate. Or more like quite unfortunate actually. So let's get some tools to remove the nozzle and the heat break while we are at it and measure the size of that. I believe it's, oh, it's one smaller. This is the biggest one. Yeah, this should work good enough. Sorry if you can't see this now, but I need to place this a little bit awkward for me to pry them apart. Okay, that's it. The interesting bit is that even though this is an MK8 style hot end and uh, heater or cooler here, the fins are a lot thicker and not as many here. So who knows how well it is, will perform, especially if you consider that there is no thermal grease on here. But let's measure the size to see which, uh, we, which uh, heat break we will need to order if we want to replace it with a Titan alloy kind or something of that sort. Perfectly. So this is a seven, yeah, seven millimeter outer diameter, and I would say an M6 thread here. Okay, that at least seems to seems to be standard. Nozzle size. Yes, also M6, perfect. This makes it a lot easier to get. Diameter, oh, seven, okay. So if you want to get a replacement and not replace the entire thing, we'll need a heat break for an MK8 style without um, the threads on the upper part and only threaded on the lower part with a seven millimeter diameter on the top part and an M6 threaded part on the lower thing. Let's get a si the entire size just to make sure because I think there are also different versions that have different lengths here. So 31, yeah, let's call it 31. So for the assembly, I will use some thermal crease. I did not expect that there is none on it, but I should have some here. You don't need to uh, get the most expensive stuff for that because um, unlike CPUs, which often use that, this one just needs a little bit.
make sure that you don't use too much of it otherwise it will end up in your filament at the first few prints which really is not something you want. This looks good. Let's tighten it down here. Also make sure that um, if you are tightening, if you are screwing these screws in, don't over tighten them. This is aluminium and the screws should be steel or something along those lines and they can easily strip out the aluminium. Just get them hand tight. That also is the same for the heater block here. And I just made a mistake. I should, I should install the heat brake in the heat block before I install it in the cooler. Otherwise, it will be quite difficult. Uh, well, I will. I will switch my gloves. Sorry for uh, this this part, but I completely forgot that if I'm not removing the cooler part of the hot end. I can't get who I can't install the heater block anymore. Great. So, all cloughed up again. Let's continue the build. Is there still enough on it? But the length here is fitting. Okay, this is too far in it. Uh, you need to adjust the um, amount you screw the, the heat break into the heater plug. If it's too far, you will have problems with installing the nozzle properly. And if it's not far in enough, you won't be able to tighten the nozzle properly. So let's back it out a little bit. Okay, this looks good. Okay, that fits perfect.
and then a little bit of isopropanol to clean off the excess. So reinstalled and reapplied thermal crease. When tightening down, when tighten down the um, the nozzle here, make sure that you not over tighten it. Only snug, because uh, you will the final tightening part will be done when the printer is hot. And also make sure that you don't uh, bend the heat brake, otherwise it will become pretty much useless. Those are the two main things with which beginners uh, have problems with and may even break the printer. So, wiggle this in place. This looks good. This looks tight as well, perfect. Okay, last thing, reattach the inductive sensor for the outer bed leveling. And then we have completely torn down the heat end, hot end. So the only thing remaining to explain will be this small controller box here, which I believe is quite ingenious actually, because the only thing you have to do is plug in um, one big uh, long cable here from the controller to this subassembly box here. Um, and this one will do all of the um, where goes what basically which makes it a lot safer, a lot easier if you have to assemble it and also a lot cleaner. The only downside of this complete sub-assembly of the hot end with this controller is the track chain. Not because the track chain itself is bad, but because the thermistor here is using braided wire, which may or may not um, get damaged over time by the track chain. Usually you want cable that is quite uh, silky on the outer face or quite smooth. Um, so I'm not quite sure how long this will stay the way it is, especially because the track chain will probably really um, not be the greatest idea for this one because uh, the bed is quite big. So this entire assembly and the track chain will kind of hang down something like this. It will later look something along this line to move freely, I believe in this way. Um, this one will wiggle a lot and will kind of sag here down. So not the best idea to use a track chain for this especially not um, with the braided wires. It would be better to use something like um, a nylon mesh um, cable sleeve with an additional reinforcement with uh, nylon filament, for example, to give it a little bit more stiffness and move it from the sideways position to an upwards arc position. This would, in my opinion, be a lot better, but um, perhaps it's something I will change later on. 
So, and the last thing with this tear down today is going to be the controller box here. These are just the smaller parts. Um, I don't think we need to disassemble this um, filament sensor. There's probably just one switch in there to detect it. So not that interesting for me. And you can get them pretty darn cheap. So nothing to be concerned about. Um, this is the SD card, micro SD card, which is a little bit unfortunate. I had hoped that they would use a regular sized SD card, not for speed or anything or rigidity, but simply for user um, ease of use. It's a little bit more difficult to get this one plugged into the controller. Um, the contents of the SD card will be on my um, website um, where you can download it or look into it. Unfortunately, Trunk-C itself does not provide any manual on their website, nor any firmware or anything like that, which I believe is a bit unfortunate um, because generally I want to look into the manual and things like that beforehand, or if I lose this SD card, pretty much I need to contact the support. And well, I'm not 100% sure how uh, fast they will react to inquiries, especially because, again, it's a China's product. But I have heard quite good things about it from um, sources online that they do actually re react to your inquiries. So uh, perhaps I'm not giving them enough credit, but uh, that's something to see in the future. So this is the main assembly of the control and uh, of the board. This uses a 30-bit ARM uh, process, I believe, if I'm not completely wrong, but it's definitely a 30-bit one, which allows you to print um, quite a bit faster if you can get enough heat into the filament and if the whole printer is going to be rigid enough to uh, get us working. But the CoXY uh, model is a little bit more complicated in the calculations than the standard Cartesian system. So it will require a little bit more um, processor power to get things working. Um, the Delta printer is the biggest problem, in my opinion, in terms of processing speed without um, a 32-bit 32 32 board. It, uh, it's, in my opinion, not really something you should, uh, you should use much simply because uh, the Delta printer can go really, really fast. But um, the 30 without a 32-bit board with the standard, uh, with the standard uh, Atmel chipset, it's, it's quite unfortunate, I would say. That's, that's the best I can tell you about that. So let's get into it. I've heard a lot about these um, boards. Um, and seen a lot of them online, especially on um, the previous versions from the X5SA and the X5S, which did not use a graphical display like this one. This one has a touchscreen. The X5S versions do not have a touchscreen. They have a rotary encoder alongside a standard LCD white blue display, I believe. So a dot matrix display. Well, we'll get that. <laughs> we will have to get that screw after this assembly. So there we are. Okay, this is interesting. This one is the big ribbon cable for the um, heat for the um, hot end part of things. This one should be hot end. Okay. This one is power. That one should be the heat bed. Why is that written with hot end? Especially because there's no connector on that side. Interesting. That would be better marked as hotbed. Hot end. No. 
But okay, the other cables probably are for the stepper driver, for stepper motors, I guess so, yes, and for the end stops. This looks all right. This one is for the temper, bad temp, okay. So let's look into it. It looks quite neat in here. Not the best cable wiring job I have ever seen, but it's okay, I guess. I would say it's okay. So we have additional filament and end stops, it would seem. Oh, these are different. Ah, okay. It looks like you can also use these one, but they are also already included in here. So you can um, plug um, different ones in here, but probably these ones won't work, work then. So that's something. I'm not quite happy with the with the way this cooler is mounted in here in terms of vibrations, but at least it is blowing on the stepper drivers. Let's tighten this down a bit because it makes me a little bit nervous. But I, oh man, the screw is completely stripped out. Okay, that's, that's something. Let's see if I can get a different set with a bigger screwdriver. Well, I did not expect to encounter a screw that is completely, completely stripped out, almost. Oh well, I guess we will have to leave it like that for the time being. Let's hope that it's not too noisy. This is also interesting. Two red wires for the... Heat bed. Well, why would you do that? But it's also saying hot end. Huh. I'm a bit confused, but the only other XT60 plug is for the hot end, is for the heat bed. So interesting way to label this one. It's also going to be interesting to see whether um, this uh, MOSFET here is going to withstand the big amount of current that is going to flow through it. But um, let's look how these, these wires are... Oh no. Sorry that I'm a little bit disappointed. But that's not the way you are supposed to do it. I mean, you can you can put them in there without um, without having a, a nice cable sh shoe or something like that. But don't thin the wires. That's that's not good practice. Simply, not only is it not good practice, it will fail over time. Um, simply because the tin on um, the wires is going to be not as hard as the copper, it will kind of flow out of the way of it after time, after a little bit of time, um, that will result in yeah, a failure eventually. Well, I guess we will have to redo this. I, I will get the stuff to do this. Luckily, I already um, got these things beforehand because I thought that this is a very likely possibility. So let's get myself some of the crimping stuff. There we go. Okay, let's get to crimping without destroying the camera at this time. Um, to crimp them remove the soldered parts because they, they are trash. Unfortunately, they are not salvageable. Um, start new with fresh bit of wire. I'm a little bit lazy, so I'm not getting my 
proper wire cutter sleeve cutter here out um, just have to make sure that I'm not accidentally cutting into the wire itself which I think I let's let's hope I did not okay perfect this should be good enough let's get one of these let's see when I left it might be a bit small a bit bigger one yeah this one looks perfect so that's how it should have been done but um, yeah well it wasn't done this way again unfortunate but let's finish this job quickly And that's the reason why I'm doing this tear down to exactly to find these problems and solve them preemptively. Because frankly, you never know with these Chinese 3D printers what you are getting yourself into. And that's one done almost if I can get it into there. Next one. Same game plan. Remove the solid bits, strip the wire, and continue. Two down, third to the two to go. Oh, this one is the one which has tint wires. So they are also mixing which wires they are using. And the last one, this one is even worse. It's not even properly tinned. And these ones are especially important to not be tinned because if they get loose, a lot of current is going to flow through them, which will heat up the connector parts and bits quite a bit. And that will lead to them, well, getting destroying themselves basically and that's not good.
If the connectors start to melt, well, your 3D printer is not far away from melting as well, or probably burning even. That was also one of the problems of these cheap ANET A8s. They had um, not the best terminals and um, they overheated the terminals and they melted and that started a fire. Um, if you Google that online, you will find a lot of images um, of these cheap A8s um, having burned parts on the board or especially around the MOSFETs, which handle the high current and especially around these connector terminals. And it's not even much to engineer. You just take the right piece and you use the right parts to connect it. And it's not that expensive, especially if we consider that they already tint them. So if someone had to solder them, why not use these shoes instead and just call it a day? But, well, that's something I will never quite understand. So that's repaired or made ready, I guess. Um, that's how it should have been looking like, the way it was in the power supply. I don't, I have no clue why they are bothering not to do this here, especially if they are using proper XT60 connectors here and have it done probably in the um, power supply. Um, well, I don't quite get why. So let's put this, put this metal piece back on it again. Close it up and call it a day for today. <sighs> yes, yes. The problem is, it's not like it's low current that is going through these thingies. It's I mean, if we uh, take the maximum amperage the uh, power supply can provide with 21 amps, that's, that's quite a lot. So um, with 24 volts and 21 amps, you can, you can easily burn down your printer. Um, so I'm not sure why they are doing it like this. And again, it's not like these sets are very expensive. Um, I got mine for, I think, 80 euros, something around these, uh, that size, that amount. And yeah, why not do it from the factory the way it is supposed to be to prevent uh, somebody's house to burn down? I believe a lot of people will, would appreciate this. But nonetheless, we have finished our part of the teardown. The next uh, videos will be um, split into multiple uh, parts um, and I will do a live build of the entire printer and you will be able to watch it um, because frankly I've never seen a complete build on these thingies, just a few live builds but none on the um, biggest version which is the 500 which again in my opinion is the most interesting one simply because there is currently no other printer in this size available. Even the high-grade prosumer uh, kind of printers do not reach this size. Only the really crazy expensive and crazy big ones do reach the size. But for the hobbyist, having something large like this is quite interesting. And as a small treat for the end, let me get this close so that you can hear it. Ah, satisfying. So let's meet again in the next uh, video, which will be the part one of the assembly.